Colorado, a state fairly known by the residents for getting plenty of tornadoes, as the state averages about 50 each year. And it's kind of surprising since Colorado only has about half of the state's size to work with because of the Rocky Mountains on the other half. Even more surprising is that a good majority of them happen in Weld County, which is one of the most tornado-prone counties in the entire U.S. Despite Eastern Colorado being a hot spot for tornadic activity, the state mostly only sees rather weak tornadoes and land spouts, thanks to the Denver Convergence Vorticity Zone. We'll get into this later. But every once in a while, the state does tend to get a strong tornado, and even deviant ones sometimes. So let's take a look at a time when a monster of a long track wedge EF3 tornado caused major impacts to eastern Colorado. The 2008 Winter EF3 Tornado. On the early morning of May 22, 2008, the Storm Prediction Center issued a moderate risk for severe weather with a hatched 15% chance for tornadoes that can strike within a 25 mile radius of this area mostly for western Kansas, with Windsor, Colorado just sitting on the edge of the slight risk and the 2%, showing that the probability of a tornado happening here is very low. In general, the main weather threat had models forecasting a deep negatively tilted upper level trough, the low pressure system, located in the western United States with a surface low near Denver, Colorado. This was going to bring surging moisture from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Plains with sufficient moisture which would develop a dry line and a warm front in Kansas, a setup perfect for tornadoes. This dry line setup was the main severe weather system that prompted the Storm Prediction Center to issue the uncommonly serious forecast, only seen a couple times a year. As shown here, this forecast extended into northeastern Colorado, with the main threat being mostly for hail, due to surface heating causing instability, which makes stronger updrafts and storms. However, Tornadoes were still a possibility, but the way the tornado threat played out for Colorado was very unexpected, especially to the locals. At 11.25 a.m., a tornado watch was issued for northeastern Colorado and parts of Nebraska and Wyoming. Now, this is a highly unusual time of day to expect tornadoes, especially in Colorado, because normally, tornadoes occur in late afternoon thanks to the daytime heating throughout the day. Most time when tornado watches are issued this early, it's usually because of tornado producing tropical systems, but in this case, the daytime heating had already caused enough instability in the atmosphere to allow developing thunderstorms to strengthen. The low at 500 and 850 millibars were both closed, causing the jet stream to bring an ample amount of wind shear to the upper and lower levels of the atmosphere. At the same time, the moisture moving in causes a spin between the two, which is vorticity. This phenomenon actually occurs quite often in the area, and is known as the Denver Vorticity Convergence Zone that I mentioned earlier, which helps with tornado development in the thunderstorm's vicinity. Also thanks to the short wave that moved in, this helps storms initiate, therefore storms were expected to fire nearby with southerly and elevated upslope winds to help with the storm formation and other storm initiation factors. As discrete storms started firing in the primed area, something about them was odd. The storms were traveling north-northwest, unlike the typical northeast direction. This is because storms move along the jet stream, which moves from west to east as it follows troughs and ridges in the atmosphere. But since this trough was negatively tilted, that meant the jet stream had to move along this bend, making it briefly go northwest, so the storm and tornado movement followed suit. Then in the late morning of May 22nd, a supercell that initiated over the Denver International Airport had begun traveling northwest. As the storm intensified, Helper radar was showing rotation, prompting a tornado warning to be issued at 11.18 a.m. This gave lead time, as it didn't produce a tornado until about 8 minutes later, when it touched down just southeast of the town of Gilcrest. As it began its journey through Weld County, the tornado barely grazed Gilcrest, and continued with its path in a rural area, with its damage really only consisting of sparse houses, barns, and farm equipment for a large portion of its path. Minutes later, the tornado neared a complex of office buildings within the Greeley city limits, and a security camera on one of these buildings managed to capture one of the most impressive shots of the tornado. Here at the complex, numerous cars were damaged or destroyed, 
and the nearby high tension power line had completely snapped, receiving an EF3 rating. But very shortly after, the tornado was headed right for a missile site park, a campsite, and is unfortunately where our first and only fatality had occurred, Vietnam veteran Mike Manchester. As he was trying to flee from the tornado in his RV, the tornado caught up and it was too late. When leaving the campsite, the tornado was headed straight for Windsor with a daycare in session, leading to the staff of the daycare and over 100 children attending to take cover in the interior rooms of the building. While in their safe spot, the daycare took a direct hit from the tornado, shattering the windows, sending flying debris inside the building. Thankfully, no one was seriously injured with the victims only receiving minor cuts and bruises. The daycare itself wasn't as badly damaged as expected, but still damaged nonetheless. After the daycare, the neighborhoods in historic downtown took a direct hit, forcing the schools into a tornado lockdown while celebrating their last day of the school year. And here in Windsor is where the worst of the damage occurred, especially in the Cornerstone neighborhood, with homes built from the late 90s to the early 2000s were impacted with EF2 to EF3 intensity as a result of many roofs to be torn off, collapsing of exterior walls, and even some tree debarking, which is seen in the strongest of tornadoes. Once the tornado left the town, the rest of the significant damage was mostly to sparse structures, and eventually, the tornado dissipated at 12.16 p.m., west-northwest of the town of Wellington. But the same supercell that produced the tornado still wasn't done, however. The same supercell produced an EF2 tornado that hit Laramie, Wyoming, before it weakened into a messy storm, showing that the supercell had miraculously survived an escalating elevation, resulting in another uncommon phenomenon of this event, as supercells typically have a hard time surviving in higher elevations. Anyways, in the end, the Windsor tornado had become Colorado's widest tornado ever recorded at one mile wide, the second longest track tornado in the state behind the November 4th, 1922 EF3, and resulting in one fatality and 78 injuries the injuries being a wide variety from critical injuries to scratches and bruises. After seeing how devastating and destructive this tornado was, the local NWS in Boulder rated it EF3 on the newly adopted Enhanced Regida Scale, along with Colorado Governor Bill Ritter declaring the area as a state disaster, but a few days later it became a national disaster, allowing better aid response to the event. National and local agencies came to help aid the town, and by the time FEMA came to Windsor, they released a map of the damage path from the tornado that extended 24 miles. They counted about 850 homes damaged, with 300 badly damaged or destroyed, resulting $147 million in damage, making this the costliest tornado to ever strike Colorado. Even with the agencies and other nearby cities coming to help, the people of Windsor were very independent during the aftermath, helping themselves immediately after the tornado, resulting in a faster recovery, and recovering for the better. That included the monetization, the rebuilding of over 400 homes, rebuilding with green slash energy efficient buildings, master plannings of the town, and much more. The town's recovery was successful and fast, and by today, the town looks like it was never hit by a tornado in the first place, showing how well was it recovered, and a great example of how a tornado town or a community should recover from a tornado. Thank you for coming by to watch my video and learn about the Windsor Tornado. It means a lot to me and probably to the people of Windsor too. I put all of my sources in the description down below, but keep in mind that some sources may not line up with this video exactly due to corrections and updates made in the years after the tornado. I also want to mention that I read every single comment I receive. If you didn't get a heart or a reply, just know that I have read your comment at some point. And a huge shout out to Beyond Storm Chaser as he helped out with some of my video and is a Colorado Storm Chaser, which I recommend checking out his channel. Since I have nothing else to say, you can like, sub, or join the Discord if you're interested in what I do, and feel free to watch another one.